G'day everyone, Viv here. I hope you're all keeping well. Welcome back. I just wanted to preface this upcoming video for Spectre uh, with a comment about the sound. It's certainly very good, but uh, you know, during editing, I noticed there was a little bit of breathing on the microphone every now and then. Some, you know, it's quite low, um, quite deep sound. So there's some popping of B's and P's and stuff. Um, but it's perfectly watchable. But you know, given I've gone to the little extremes of you know getting out my proper studio camera and wireless mics and all that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, I want it to be perfect. Uh, so just wanted to mention that before you watch the video. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for tuning in. G'day everyone, Viv here. I hope you're all keeping well. Welcome back. Fourth time, maybe fifth time trying to film this video. I've got my mics and everything hooked up. Got some power for my cameras. You know, I've been having a hell of a time trying to get, you know, proper good clean audio. But I think I figured out what I was doing and, you know, I don't need to admit what I was doing because it was incredibly stupid. But uh, hopefully this time it's going to work out. So let's let's have another look, <coughs> excuse me, at Spectre Operations. You know, I've spoken about the rule book. Um, I did a, a very quick sort of um, video on, on how to put together a force. Now we need to just quickly run through, you know, the four phases of a turn, the turn sequence. Um, there are really no turn limits that's determined by the scenario or, or your mission that you're playing. But each turn consists of four phases. An initiative phase, a command phase, excuse me, a movement and tactical actions phase, and a combat phase. So I've got the rule book open here. And if we flip through here, you can see we just keep rotating through these uh, different sorts of phases. Um, Every, every turn. The initiative phase is fairly straightforward. This determines who goes first during each of the phases. The game is I go, you go, but not I do everything and then you do everything and then we go back and forward like that. The initiative determines who acts first during each phase. So it's fairly straightforward. You can see here on the table, you know, so I've already got a little bit of clutter here from the previous attempts at tr trying to do this video. So anyway, let's, uh, you know, here I've got a, a force recon guy and a uh, insurgent up here. We'll use the red dice for the insurgent and the green dice for the good guys. Um, it's fairly straightforward. Command, everyone has a command stat. The initiative roll is basically a dice roll, a d6 plus your command stat. So if we go back a couple of pages and we have a look here, my trained uh, professional soldier he has a command of three and my militiaman has a command of two so let's roll these dice i'll add two to the red one whoa bang headshot um so we get a five and a five in this case it's a draw then we just keep going again so this time we've got a six and a five so now my force recon guys have the initiative uh, for this turn. That's done at the beginning of every turn. It's the first phase. Second phase is the command phase. So now that my force recon guy has um, command, you know, he'd be going first in this instance. Now the command phase allows you to issue out different sorts of orders to different sorts of troops or squads on the table. Now different sorts of uh, models can issue uh, some commands, some can't. For example, you can see here in the book that Overwatch can be issued by all troops, whereas um, the Breakdown command can only be issued by squad leaders and commanders. Um, the Call for Reinforcements can only be issued by the commander. So again, if we look back on our... Um, our list here, you know, you've got a regular sort of trooper, then a team leader and a commander um, that you use to put your force together. And during the command phase, you know, we can allocate out these different sorts of abilities. Now, they're very useful for, you know, doing different sorts of things. For example, if you want to put somebody on Overwatch to allow them to shoot an enemy during their turn, this is when you do that. Perhaps you might have, for example, this uh, command action called Rally. You might have a lot of suppression on one of your units and you can use that Rally action to remove some of that suppression. So in this instance, my... US Force Recon guy would go first, and then the insurgents would go next. Then we move to the next phase. The next phase is really where, you know, we start to get into things. Now, for the purposes of this video, you know, I am going to skip over a whole bunch of the, the extra details. Not quite advanced rules, but things from a, you know, a basic understanding of the game we don't need to be too concerned about. 
So when we look at this movement uh, and the tactical actions in just a minute, you know, we'll skip over uh, things like moving through difficult terrain or dangerous terrain, moving through fire, um, moving alert and unalert models. We'll skip over moving covertly and all that sort of stuff and just, you know, just understand the basic turn sequence. And, you know, in subsequent videos, we'll get into much more detail about each of these different phases, you know, so that AI I can learn them. And, you know, the more times I film, the more things I learn, the more things I remember. So don't be too concerned if you're watching this that oh, you've got that wrong or you've missed this. Of course, you know, I'm going to get things wrong. And, you know, sometimes I intentionally skip things for the sake of, you know, trying to just slowly reveal the game until at this point, you know, we've got a real solid, under, uh, solid understanding of, of what we're doing. So during this movement and tactical actions phase, you know, the rule book does, um, you know, outline obviously all the different things about difficult terrain, impassable terrain, climbing, moving through flames, carrying uh, captives and unconscious or casualty models, etc. How to move your squads. So squads need to maintain a, a unique coherency on the table of two inches. And a squad uh, can be uh, a minimum of two guys. So this squad here, you know, is incoherency. The only squads that don't need to be in coherency are elite troops. They can go anywhere they want individually. They don't have to maintain any sort of structure. Okay, so before we get onto these tactical actions, which you can see here, deploy non-lethal combat sprint, tactical movement, etc., let's just have a real quick look at an example of movement. So my force recon guy is down the corner here. He's behind this building. He wants to come around the corner and have a couple of shots at these guys. I can move six inches. Everybody move six inches. So let's just say I want to get this guy out and sort of pop him here, <laughs> right in the middle of the open. Um, that's a standard move action. Now, obviously things like dangerous terrain and difficult terrain and you know climbing over obstacles and all that sort of stuff influence your standard movement. But that's movement, it's six inches. So let's put this guy back here. Let's put him around the corner here. Now tactical actions are, uh, are um, actions <laughs> that can be assigned to anybody. Um, now, two of the biggest ones that you'll use here will be combat sprint and tactical movement. Now, I've made some handy little reference cards here to help me remember, um, you know, what I'm doing without having to flip through the book. And, you know, when somebody needs to know some sort of detail, I can say, here's the, the combat sprint or here's the tactical movement or here's the, 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 the breaching tactical action, etc. Now, we'll cover these uh, actions later on, but I just do want to quickly run through the combat sprint and the tactical movement because, you know, they're relevant uh, to movement. And in terms of just getting to understand the basics, these will be two of the tactical actions that you'll use fairly often. So combat sprint allows you to move faster. It's basically a de uh, the six inch movement plus your agility. It does have some negative modifiers, um, or not modifiers, but um, you can't shoot during the combat phase and you can't use this to run into hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's a different tactical action uh, called close combat. So. My Force Recon guy has an agility of four, and you can see that again in the book if we flip back here to the model's profile statistics. My uh, professional soldier has an agility of four, so I simply add that to six inches, you know, now I can move 10 inches. So I might want to run sort of over here into this little gap here. Let's just assume the guy with the RPG is not standing, standing right beside him. Um, so I can move by, by uh, 10 inches. But as I said, I can't shoot during the combat phase and I can't use that to engage someone in hand to hand. Let's have a look at this tactical movement. So we'll come back around the corner here again. Tactical movement is, um, you know, you're, you're moving very cautiously, very steady gun up, ready, um, tactically. You're moving tactically. So instead of moving six inches, all I can do is move my agility. And as we've just seen, the agility for my force recon guy is four inches. So if I move slowly around this corner here, maybe I'll hug this building. You know, I'm going to get sort of to around here somewhere. Um, my defense stat is increased by one. And enemy detection rolls against me. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about spotting and um, using scanning um, actions and all that sort of stuff later on. Um, are reduced um, or they have a negative modifier to their detection rolls. So we'll, we'll worry about that later on. But now I've moved around the corner. Now I can start laying down some cover fire in the combat phase. So this guy moves up here during his turn. My uh, militia squad, you know, they're freaking out a little bit because this uh, force recon guys just popped around the corner. They weren't expecting him. So they're all going to try and run behind this uh, wall here. 
So six inches is my standard movement. Everyone can get behind the wall. To get over that wall, I need to pass an agility test. So let's get this guy over the wall. And an agility test is just a D6. And it's got to be equal to a less than my agility. And I'm pretty sure if we have a look again in the book, um, for a militiaman, their agility is three. So I need three or more for three or less for this guy. No, he's stuck. This guy. No, these militiamen, they just want to line up against that wall, don't they? <laughs> this guy. Oh, the commander gets over, of course he does. The squad leader and one of his friends with the, the light machine gun gets over the back. So there we go. That's movement pretty much. It's six inches and those tactical movement and combat sprint tactical actions are generally what are going to be using to move around the board. And then obviously, you know, there's uh, some rolls and stuff, agility tests for climbing up and down things and climbing over things and whatnot. But that's movement. Let's have a look at some shooting now. That happens during our combat phase. So if we flip over... Here's our combat phase, right? There's a couple of different ways of performing combat. There's close combat and there's uh, ranged combat or what's called direct fire combat. Let's just look at direct fire combat at the moment. And all we're going to be concerned with is just the core mechanics of shooting a gun at someone. We'll talk about blast weapons, grenade weapons, things scattering and drifting all across the board and all that sort of stuff later on. Off-table artillery, airstrikes, all that sort of stuff. You know, that's detailed stuff that we can look at, you know, after this video. So the combat phase to uh, fire at somebody, it's four steps, basically. Established line of sight, a targeting role, a lethality role, and a casualty role. And we'll explain those very briefly uh, as we go through this little example here. So... My force recon guys popped around the corner here. I want to lay off a shot against these guys over here. So the first thing I need to do, do uh, need to do is determine, do I have line of sight? And just like most war games, you know, peer over and have a look. And the rule book does specifically mention uh, how you determine line of sight. But I can see this guy on the end here. So I'm going to have a shot on this guy here. Now he's 10 inches away. I'm carrying a carbine and a carbine has a range of 16 inches. Now, it's worth mentioning in this game that weapons in this game, most weapons in this game, certainly rifles and carbines, etc., don't have a range limit. They can shoot across the entire width and breadth of the table, um, but they operate in range bands. How effective are they? Obviously, a weapon gets less effective, you know, the further out it goes. So, in this instance, the carbine operates in 16-inch range intervals, 16-inch sections, what they call range intervals. Now, there's no modifier for shooting at someone who's within, you know, your optimal range, in this case, 16 inches. As soon as I go out to, you know, 17 inches and then, you know, 33 inches, you know, multiples of 16, I move into the next range band. And you can see that down the bottom here. That's the range intervals. So I get a modifier and whether or not the weapon causes suppression or not. So for me, in my first three range bands, I can cause suppression, but it gets progressively harder and harder for me to hit as I go out. You can see the negative modifiers here. So first thing, am I in line of sight? Yes, I am. Now I need to make a targeting roll. The targeting roll is fairly straightforward. It's simply a D6. Green for the good guys. Yep. A D6 plus my shooting stat versus my opponent's D6 and his defense stat. And then we both plus or minus any modifiers. So in this instance, if we flip back to our little table here, our professional soldier, he has a shooting stat of five. And my militiaman has a defense of two. So this guy doesn't have any cover or any bonuses that are applicable to him. So we'll just roll his dice, five, and, so, and add two to it, his defense. So now he's got a total of seven. My um, force recon guy here, what did we say? He's got a shooting value of four. Five for a professional soldier. Okay, so we've got a D6 plus five. So I'm getting uh, eight on this roll here. Now, there are no modifiers for me. Um, you know, this guy's within my range band. We're not worrying about weapon attachments. And, you know, if I had a, you know, laser sights and red dots and all that sort of stuff, if we had a look at the rules for carbines, um, they get a modifier uh, uh, for being within their optimal range band, etc. But, you know, let's forget about those details. We'll look at that when we talk about gear. From the basic core mechanics, it's a straight up opposed role. In this case, I've got an eight versus a seven. This guy's been hit now. 
And because he's been hit, or regardless of whether he's been hit, and this is one thing that you know I kind of need to confirm a little bit more, is that now that this guy has been hit, and I think whether he's been hit or not, we still allocate a point of suppression to him. You know, he's a little bit intimidated. He's been shot at. Whether he actually gets hit and wounded or killed is relevant. So he's been hit. Now I need to make a lethality roll. And if we flip all the way through to the back of the book here, in the weapons section, you can see here under profiles, every weapon has a lethality rating. In this case for carbines, it's four plus. So I need to roll a four or more to kill this guy, which I do. This guy now dies. We'll take him off the board. And for the sake of fun, it's nice to see where people die. So I put a corpse token down. Excuse me, you don't need to do that during the game, but for me, I want to be able to see where all the action has happened without having a whole bunch of miniatures lying down and the paint chipping and stuff as I'm laying them down on my table covered in sandpaper. Um, I'll put a to uh, corpse token down. So that guy's died. Now that he's died, I need to allocate the suppression that we gave to him to somebody else in the squad. They're freaking out now that their friend's been killed. So I'm going to give it to this guy next to him. That's shooting. Now it's time for the... Um, Mm, the militants, the, the 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 rebels, the insurgents, whoever, to shoot back. So let's do this guy here who's got the point of suppression. So he has a shooting value, I'm fairly certain, of two. Militia. No, I'm not fairly certain. He's got a shooting value of three. My professional soldier has a defense of two. You can see the defense value on everybody is two, except for uh, civilians and, and, and elite guys who have three. So let's do this guy first we'll roll his defense because it's easy to remember it's a dice roll plus two so he's currently sitting on five there's no modifiers for him um you know even though he did move tactically and i'll put a little tactical token next to him um you know that doesn't have anything to do with uh uh you know defense stats oh it does defense stat increased by one here we go so now that's up to a six because we move tactically oh this guy's shooting at this guy. Two plus three, my shooting ability, gives me a total of five. Minus that point of suppression that I'm carrying gives me a result of four. So I haven't managed to hit this guy. Let's do the next guy. So six plus three is nine. This guy's not carrying any suppression, so he's all right. His nine beats this six. So do I um, kill him? The AK has a lethality rating of four plus. No. So all I've done is wound this guy. So if you don't kill someone uh, when you're rolling on the lethality table, then you need to make a casualty roll. And if we go back all the way back to the our uh, shooting section, combat phase, here's the casualty table. Is six different types of casualties. Light wounds, medium wounds, incapacitating serious wounds, incapacitating serious wounds, catastrophic incapacitating wounds, and catastrophic incapacitating wounds. Now, that, you know, doesn't make much sense to me. There's six different types of wounds there. So on my little stat card that I've made, and on the Facebook group, there's a whole bunch of awesome little player aids and stuff that different people have made in the file section on the Facebook group. I call them light, medium, serious, incapacitated, critical, and critical and catastrophic. Just so you know, each wound type has a different name and I've made different tokens for each one of those. So now we need to roll on that chart and see what happens. So two, two is a medium wound. So we'll put a little moody, medium wound counter next to this guy and clear our dice out the way. So a medium wound, he may only crawl three inches. He can fire his primary and sidearm for two turns and then he's recovered. So there we go, and then obviously my other guys would shoot. And when it's everyone shooting is finished, we'd go back and we'd start a new initiative round. Now, let's have a look at that initiative round because in this case, this turn two, the initiative is affected by suppression. So we'll come back to the table, and uh, the red guys and the green guys, his D6 plus his command, um, I think it's three, maybe four, can't quite remember, let's... Quickly have a look at professional soldier. Command is three, yes. Yeah, so now I've got a total of five over here. And for this guy, it's two. So one plus two is three, minus a point of suppression, which brings him to a total of two. 
And now initiative swings back to my force recon guys, and they can go ahead and keep to, um, progressing through the you know the command phase, movement, and tactical actions, and and then combat. So that's the the turn sequence in Spectre. Um, you know, most of the mechanics in this game are fairly straightforward. Um, and all the detail and nuance and stuff comes from your gear and, you know, special circumstances. Um, so we'll go through all those gear and equipment and special circumstances as we progress through these videos. And we might interrupt those with me sort of just playing games amongst myself to become, you know, quite solid and familiar with the various um, mechanics from the book. Anyway, I hope that's been useful. Um, you know, not a massive sort of this is how you do it, but more sort of this is what's in the game uh, type of video. Anyway, thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you next time. Uh, yeah, have a good weekend. See ya.